Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video, we're going to talk about infrared, that is IR spectroscopy. We're going to start by introducing what we mean by infrared spectroscopy. We're going to introduce the concepts that we use when we measure this way called wave numbers. We're going to look at the types of vibrations that occur in a molecule as a result of infrared radiation. We're going to look at the factors that affect the vibrations that a molecule might do. We're going to examine kind of an example of an infrared spectrum. We're going to look at the different functional groups we can find or we'll kind of use to, uh, to, to solve a puzzle with this sort of spectrum. And then we're going to have a look at an example of actually using it for the identification of a particular substance. <clears throat> so firstly, what is infrared spectroscopy? Essentially, we're looking at the absorption of infrared radiation, that is IR, to deduce molecular structure. So it's not so much about identifying what elements are present or their percentage composition by mass. We're not looking, um, it doesn't give us information about the size of the molecule, that is how heavy it is. You know, mass spectrometry is more useful for that, but it helps us to understand um, the different kind of functional groups that might exist because all matter, all particles will absorb infrared. We've looked at UV um, visible spectrophotometry in another video where only certain molecules are going to absorb in those areas, but all molecules will absorb IR to some degree. What it does is that it causes the bonds within the structure to start to vibrate. And so that is the kind of, we, we get them vib those vibrations happening in lots of different ways, and it creates essentially this kind of resonance signal that it kind of makes it vibrate backwards and forwards, thinking about like a guitar string, you know, or, or kind of the string in a piano that gets hit when the, you strike the key that then it actually kind of makes it hum according to the type of information, the type of um, radiation that's been absorbed. You get this resonance idea of the vibrations. Now, one of the things that it's important that we, we kind of get out of the way first is, is a property about infrared radiation or about this, this technique that we use. And it's called, this idea called wave numbers. Because we know that um, infrared, like all other electromagnetic radiation, has a frequency and a wavelength, and it moves at the set velocity, the, the speed of light. But because of the, the wavelengths that we're talking about here, that we want to get a number that's a bit more practical to measure, rather than dealing with weird kind of powers of 10 or kind of, you know, abstract kind of measurements of length, that we actually do this little maths transformation. And that is, we say, we talk about the wave number being the reciprocal of the wavelength in centimetres. So we take the wavelength and we, we convert it to centimetres and we do the reciprocal of that, and that generates what we call the wave number. The reason, and with units of, um, per centimetre. So it's essentially how many waves do we have per centimetre of space. The reason that we might do this is it now gives us integers between 0 and 4,000 um, in terms of actual kind of size. And so we actually get these nice kind of integers that we can work with for the same rationale that we make the pH, we use pH to transform H plus concentration because it's easier to work with. Now what this means is that for the longer the wavelength, the lower the wave number. That is, the fewer number of waves you get every centimetre of distance. Conversely, that the shorter the wavelength, the higher the wave number is. Okay, so 4,000 wave numbers is a lot shorter wavelength than 500 wave numbers, which is shorter than one wave number. Okay, so that's kind of to give you that, that sense of scale. The, the reason we talk about this is that when you'll see the x-axis of, a, of a, an infrared spectrum, that we use this as a measure, um, and so it's important to kind of know what it's what it's about. So we said that all matter absorbs infrared radiation and it causes vibrations to occur in that molecule. So we're talking about molecular structure here rather than separate atoms. Now the way that that, mat that, that type of energy interacts with the molecule, we get different types of movements or vibrations that we can see, some of which you can represent here with a, a molecule which is essentially, oh, I believe it's a water molecule, um, you know, so, so you can kind of get these different movements. So the covalent bonds, it, it helps to visualise them like a spring. Now we're going to see in a moment actually kind of some, some images that, that show that a bit more specifically, but if you think about it like a spring, we can stretch a spring, um, and we can bend a spring, and we can twist a spring. Okay, and so what happens is that if each of these bonds is like a spring, that they could be stretching symmetrically, that is at the same amount at the same time, we could be stretching asymmetrically, so kind of one's compressing as the other's stretching, and so they're out of kind of phase with each other. We can also get a bending that's kind of like if we visualise it like that, where it's kind of bending like this. Um, and then we can also get some rotation. So we can get rotation in the x-axis, rotation in the y-axis, and rotation in the z-axis, kind of like that. 
So different, the three different dimensions. Um, as we start to add in more atoms that we can also get different types of movements called wagging and rocking and things like that that are for non-linear but asymmetric molecules. So this one's a symmetrical molecule, so we get a range of different vibrations here. So essentially the different types of covalent bonds and the different positions that they have will cause different kind of resonance frequencies that you might get. You know, resonate at different amounts of energy. Now the reason that they end up with different amounts of energy is that there's different factors that are going to affect um, how that, that the frequency at which we get a vibration. You know, think about it like music, that, that idea that different factors are going to affect the sound that we get um, you know, and therefore the pitch that we get um, based on things we change, you know, where you put your fingers on the, the fretboard of a guitar or which keys that you hit on the piano for strings of different length or you name it. Okay, and so one factor that affects the type of vibrations, oh, sorry, how strong they are is the type of bend or type of movement we're making. Are we stretching, which requires more energy than a bending? Okay, or then the twisting. You know, so stretching tends to be the highest energy type of um, vibration that can happen um, because you're trying to pull atoms away from each other um, that are stable being in that bond. Okay, so a CH stretch, carbon-hydrogen bond stretch, is at a higher level than the bend. Okay, the other, another thing that affects it is the strength of the bond. That is, um, you know, how strong that covalent bond is on its own, but also if we have a, a, a set number of bonds single bond, double bond, triple bond. You know, think about it like we're connecting multiple springs that you're going to then get a different amount of, of energy to actually get it to stretch or bend. Um, and also that as you add in more bonds, you tend to get less bending and more stretching because it becomes more locked in to its kind of structure like that. You can't bend a triple bond very easily like you can a single bond, but you can stretch it backwards and forwards. But it's harder because you're stretching more bonds, more springs at the same time. The next thing that can affect it is the mass of the atom that's at the other end of the spring. Okay, if it has a lower, a lighter mass, you'll get a faster vibration. It's easier, lower energy. Once with greater mass, you get a slower vibration. Um, okay, and so so that affects what you you see as well. So comparing like carbon chlorine versus carbon bromine, you get a different amount, slower versus faster. All right, so this is an example of the kind of spectrum that you see. Um, as a result of this technique. So you can see our x-axis down the bottom here has wave numbers um, and it shows, you know, labels that and it gives you that it, it's a unit. Um, but you can see that it's, it, this spectrum looks like it's upside down, that we've got high points and we've got these low points. But the low points is actually the bit that is most interesting for us. It's kind of, I mean, you picture it like stalactites, that we're starting from the top and then it's actually coming down for areas of interest. Because one thing to keep in mind here is that we're looking at absorbing infrared light but this spectrum expresses the y-axis in terms of transmittance. That is how much light gets through of that type. And so where it's more strongly absorbed, you're going to get a lot less coming through. Okay, so the lower the point, the more it's actually absorbing that frequency um, and, and which corresponds to a certain bond or certain functional group that would be present in the, the spectrum. So we're looking at the low points rather than saying, all right, well, here's a high point, high point, high point. Okay, so keep that in mind. You can see this kind of zigzaggy pattern. It's all, you know, we're absorbing at very different kind of um, wavelengths in the infrared spectrum. So if we look at our x-axis, that our energy of our waves is increasing from right to left. So as the wave number increases, the energy is increasing. So 500 um, centimeters, but 500 per centimeter is the lowest, much lower compared with 4,000 per centimeter. Okay, so um, th that idea of, you know, just inter how you interpret which functional group and what that means about it. Um, but it's less, it, it, this technique is less about describing why bonds are high or low energy and more about understanding, well, because of what the bond is like, where would I find the peak on this spectrum? That's ultimately what we want to be able to do. We say, all right, well, where are the things that correspond to particular functional groups? Where is a carbon, carbon double bonded to oxygen? Where is an OH group? Because that's ultimately what's most useful about this technique. And I'll show you why. Because each, so yeah, and then this region, before I move on, is known as the fingerprint region. Because this bit is where it gets really complicated um, and hard to actually pick out set groups or set peaks. Um, but what it is, is it's distinctive for that particular compound. So yes, it's hard to actually, it's messy, but it's unique. And so the, the presence in that fingerprint region can be very helpful to identify 
a specific compound rather than just something as a member of a, a set family. But in order to identify what family it's a part of, we need to know where do the certain functional groups have peaks on an infrared spectrum. Okay, so in here is, uh, there's a range of different resources you can access that will show you this visually. This is kind of the summary that comes from our, our data sheet. But actually seeing, okay, well, that the, that the highest energy is the NH bond in an amine. And then we've got alcohols, the OH group, we've got a carbon hydrogen stretch, um, and then kind of proceeding down from there. Okay, so you can see that if a molecule has these different groups in it, that this is where we should identify that particular, particular signal. Um, but also the shape of that signal can be very useful for us. So it's position, so where we find it, and it's relative shape. Because you can see that these OH groups here correspond to either an alcohol or as part of a carboxylic acid. <clears throat> but the shape that we see and where we see it will be different. Okay, so if I flick back to here, so this is the kind of OH group that we would see from a carboxylic acid. It actually kind of blends over the carbon hydrogen um, stretch. So it's kind of it actually kind of <laughs> the nickname is going to be it looks like a hairy beard. It kind of comes down in this wide sort of thing with these scraggly bits at the end, like a hairy beard. Okay, whereas for an alcohol that we would see it being further up and a bit more distinctive. Um, so the shape that it has is also useful information to help us identify what functional group is present. And the fact that uh, certain peaks might be absent helps us to narrow down what part of what functional group or what family it's not. You know, if we don't have an OH group there, then it can't be an alcohol or a carboxylic acid. If we don't have the NH group, it can't be an amine. So sometimes it's also about eliminating possibilities more than it is about including possibilities. Because sometimes it can be hard to tell, especially for simple, straightforward alkanes, that distinguishing them using this technique is very difficult in any meaningful, definitive sense. So here is an example of a, of a sample spectrum that we might be asked to interpret. Okay, It doesn't tell you what the different things are. So what we have to do is we've got to use that reference information to pick out the key parts. Now, one that's going to be present in just about every hydrocarbon you ever see is this CH stretch peak here. Okay, that's not unique, um, but it's where it is can relate to the type of compound that it is. But it's important to be able to recognise that that's what that is. The next one, though, that's really quite relevant is the OH stretch here. So this is our alcohol, where we talked about carboxylic acids being a scraggly um, hairy beard, this is like a sharp tongue is sometimes how it's referred to. You can see that it's actually kind of this much more defined, steep, separate peak instead of this scraggly thing that goes across this big area. Okay, so it's got an OH stretch, we've got a carbon hydrogen stretch. We don't have the presence of a C double bond O stretch, which would be around about here. You know, that's a very distinctive peak that we're missing. So it suggests that we don't have a carboxylic acid or an ester or some other thing that might have contain this sort of group. Okay, um, the CO stretch is not likely to be in here somewhere, but it can be a bit difficult to identify conclusively. So it suggests that the compound must be an alcohol because we have the OH but no carbon double bond oxygen. And also the shape of this is that it's higher and not as broad as we would expect from an acid. Now, we've narrowed it down to an alcohol, but well, we can't really go a lot further than that with this sort of situation, without something to compare it to or without some additional information to help us. And so that's why this is a useful technique, but up to a point. So we've looked at the principles behind infrared spectroscopy, looking at the absorption of IR to actually help characterise the structure of a molecule. We're talking about organic compounds. We use the measure of wave numbers to, as a more practical way to look at the properties of the waves we're, we're using. We looked at the different types of vibrations that infrared can cause in a molecule and that they have different levels of energy. The different levels of energy are caused by things like the type of vibration we're looking at, um, the mass of the atoms that we're doing and the relative strength and number of the bonds that we're doing for a given place in our molecule. We looked at an example of an infrared spectrum and seeing the sort of information that it provides and the shape that we see. We looked at the different functional groups that we can identify from an infrared spectrum or use to help um, to, uh, you know, unlock that information and then we had a go at seeing how that could be useful to us. Alright, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.